2024 has been one of, if not the most eventful year in my lifetime. And just looking broadly out and all the news that's been coming in, you might think that we've been experiencing a lot of things that we would call unprecedented. And well, let's just say with the guests that I have on today, longtime guest, multiple time guest, John Marshall. We're going to be going over a few different things, and I can guarantee you, you're going to learn a thing or two today that might freak you out a little bit. You might come to find out that this year may not be as unprecedented as we think living through it, and I think we all know that history comes, maybe not in repeating patterns, but often comes in a very similar shade of color. I'm Sal with We The Patriots Podcast. Let's get right into it. I've been wanting to do a show with you for a little bit. Um, it's just that so many so things kept happening so quickly. And it was like, well, when is a good opportunity to do it? And oddly enough, now that it seems the Kamala campaign is in full swing. It's the best time to do it. Not too much is actually happening. <laughs> so the whole reason of me reaching out, I sent you a message earlier today. The whole point of the show, at least to me today, is kind of talking about the amount of things that we're calling unprecedented or haven't happened in decades that are happening in this election cycle. At uh, the same, so- My Wi-Fi has been out for the past two weeks in and out. <laughs> Don't know where it came from, you know great infrastructure that we have in this country that's going on right now. <laughs> but um, either way, the the whole reason of having you on is all these weird things that maybe not even unprecedented, but haven't happened in decades, all happening in the same electric, election cycle. And I wanted to get an outsider's opinion, someone who definitely studied a lot more history than myself and see what it looks like from the outside in, I guess, would be a good thing. So I guess we'll start first. How did you feel about the debates being set when they were way before, I believe, any previous debates for a presidential election? Yeah, I, I think it was very much a in some ways, I think it could could have been a very a brilliant move on the part of the Democrats to essentially strive what they had in a candidate Uh you know, we we see it from the outside, and I think everybody knew that Biden was slipping. I don't think that everyone knew badly he was slipping. Uh, I think there were different degrees of. I mean, we we knew he was certainly advancing in age. We knew he seemed to be tired at points, perhaps not up to the job at points. I think that there were some who were really sounding the alarm about his kind of declining cognitive ability reading off teleprompters, and they really kept him very insulated. He he pretty much ran for president from his basement in 2020 because it was like, oh, well, it's COVID, so I, I don't need to go out and campaign. Right. He made 2020 a referendum on Trump, and it's it was it was nothing about Biden. Nobody was, or very few people, maybe a couple of people holed up in Delaware were voting for Biden. The vast majority of Biden voters were voting against Trump. Right. And by pretty much not campaigning, he was making it entirely about Trump. And that worked in in 2020. This time around, I think there were enough questions about where Biden was in terms of his preparation that that wasn't going to fly. He wasn't going to be able to hide in his basement. The fact that this debate was staged so early on, before uh, candidates were certified, before the conventions, really tells me that it was in many ways a setup. I mean, Biden wouldn't, his whole track record of campaigning in the last couple cycles was to not campaign. So the fact that his team would be out there agreeing to a debate so early in this really makes it seem like it was kind of a setup on the well, part of the Democrats. And if it was, it was, it was, it was probably back. a ra- rather brilliant maneuver because had they gone through the convention and certified Biden as their nominee and told all the states, yes, put Biden and Harris on the ticket and print the ballots and all that kind of stuff. And then he did this kind of debate performance where he was, you know, obviously outclassed to the point where I think, you know, the the general reaction was somewhere between horror and pity for this guy who just clearly didn't have his act together. It, it allowed the Democrats to, yeah, I think you're going to have the Democratic convention after that's all over with. 
then would be the time for a debate because that's when debates always were. They were always in September, early October. That was the typical debate schedule. So that CNN debate was really very much a staged event. And it kind of gives credence to the idea that some on the inside of the Biden campaign, whether it was in the the DNC or within the Biden White House, pretty much knew that he was not capable of pulling this off and wanted to essentially expose what was really going on, show the world, this is what you're getting. Do you really want this and allow the Democratic Party to pivot to anybody, whether it was Kamala or somebody? You can go ahead and reset. So, And I'm back in the game. Yeah, you look a little... You do look a little less pixelated this time, which is good. Oh, we don't record at the highest quality. It's just what shows on your screen. Depending on my connection, it might be gobbledygook, which I'm sure <laughs> it has been. Okay. And with the debates, that has been, if I'm not mistaken, one of the core tenets of presidential elections for as long as I can remember studying. Yeah. Um, at you least know, since the Civil War. We, no? It was actually later than that. Debating has always been a bit of an American pastime. In fact, we talk about yeah. the Lincoln-Douglas debates where they were debating for the U.S. Senate in Illinois, and that was maybe the most famous political That's debates in our I history. The Civil War. No, that was my first but, but uh, that was a statewide thing, and it was also more of a debate about issues that were going on in the country at the time. They weren't necessarily debating over who should be senator, they were debating a set of ideas hmm. around the um, essentially the competing visions of how do we move forward as a country with the question of slavery, the transcontinental railroad, all the different pieces that were in play at that period in our history. In terms of, of the presidential elections, it really was kind of considered unbecoming for candidates to do any sort of real campaigning in, our, in most of our early history. It wasn't until certainly post-Civil War and really up until uh, around the turn of the century, we started to see some major changes in the way that campaigns were conducted and also the candidates were selected. The whole notion, you know, we have this kind of microscopic view of our history in the sense that like, well, as long as I can remember, there have been primaries. So they must have always had primaries, but that really is not true. The whole notion of a primary was something that was really a product of the progressive era at essentially the turn of the 20th century, um, early nerds. Before that, from about the mid eight early 80s, up until that time, candidates were chosen in conventions, but you had very little democratic input into that. It was party leaders, party bosses who would kind of pull strings and, you know, back rooms and make deals. And that's how they selected presidential candidates. And of course, even earlier than that, you had a, a very convoluted system in the Constitution, which had in, in the original version, you had the highest vote getter becoming president, the second highest vote getter becoming vice president, right, which like is how we ended up with yeah, Washington and Adams. And then Adams and, and uh, Jefferson in 1796, and then Jefferson and Burr in 1800. And, and by then, it was pretty clear to everybody that this was a very flawed system. And then you, you saw some reforms. So it's been an evolution. You had that first wave of reforms uh, after the election of 1800. You had the development of conventions um, beginning in the 1830s. I believe uh, the Know Nothing Party held the yeah. first convention in 1831. Or actually, that, that's that's incorrect. It was the the anti Masonic Party. Okay. Um, Where, where's the Know Nothing Party from? I remember reading about that. Oh, the Know Nothings were uh, no, no. sort of anti anti immigrant. They actually sort of they were in the lead up to the Civil War, and the anti Masonics who held that first convention actually kind of morphed. Many of them morphed into the uh, the Know Nothings as the Civil War approached. But they were—they tended to be a nationalistic, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic third party, and pushing the main. And the anti-Masonics were were obviously against this notion that you'd have a sort of secret class of leaders, especially because many of the early leaders of our country were Masons. Right. So that's what I wanted to allude to. So Freemasonry used to be a massive part of our. A lot of our founding fathers were Freemasons, if I'm not mistaken. Or <laughs> at least a considerable number of them were. And that yes. started to fade. And that's very interesting. So this was all kind of guild-driven. And like you said, so it was down ballot that they would, these conventions would select. 
all of their, right. all of the yeah, so, um, their nominees for every position. It has sure. nothing so, to do with any sort of popular vote. Yeah, no, in, in individual states, you'd have a state convention that would nominate people. Um, the only places you might actually see like true free democratic elections would be on the very local level where it was okay. not even as party driven so much as you'd have you know it's driven bill who bill who had this set of ideas and joe who had that set of ideas and then you just right. have a have a local vote but when you're talking about like senators and governors and th those tended to be hand picked by party bosses who uh who drove a lot of that decision making and and there's been there were a whole bunch of cases where you had interesting deal making that went on and sometimes candidates were picked not because of their particular qualifications, but because they didn't offend anybody. Uh, the perfect example of that was James Buchanan, who is often considered one of our, our weakest presidents. In 1856, he was a Democrat from Pennsylvania. The Democrats had a, a major problem because they were a very much divided party. And in fact, in 1860, they split into factions. But your Southern Democrats were pro-slavery. All the Southern slaveholding class were all Southern Democrats. In the North, you had um, the sort of more Northern urban industrial Democrats, right. and there was very much a schism between the two. So you had to find a candidate who would somewhat appeal to both of those factions. They really didn't like to touch the slavery issue because it was not a winning issue in the North, and it was an, almost a non-negotiable in the South. The a uh, handful of issues that had really defined that 1856 election came back to the Compromise of 1850. The um, a lot of the the settlements that uh, Kansas Nebraska Act, like uh, everything that went on in that 1850s decade. James Buchanan had been out of the country. He was serving as an ambassador um, in Europe, so he had he wasn't on the record as voting for or against any of these things. He was kind of a a very milk toast figure who didn't really have strong allegiances to either northern or southern sides. He was from Pennsylvania, which wasn't a true northern industrial state. It wasn't a true western state. It wasn't a true southern state. It was kind of in the middle. And so he became this like guy who wasn't because he was he was put forward because he wasn't a great candidate, but he didn't offend any of their needed voting blocks. And so Buchanan wow, became the Democratic like nominee. Might be our president right now. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very much in fact in some ways it's like the Joe Biden thing. Like I mean nobody was like actively loving John, Joe Biden, but Joe Biden was wasn't seen as too liberal or too uh too conservative or too you know northern or too southern or too this or too that. He was just yeah, kind of just you know point out that. grandpa. Hey. Yeah and grandpa in the basement and you know when they wanted to make the election about are you for or against Trump, having grandpa in the basement was maybe the best option for, for the Democrats in twenty twenty. But now yeah. that the campaign is was going on and it started becoming a referendum on Biden and Biden's competence and fitness for office, then that's not a good situation. You, you know, you, you don't want it to be a referendum about you. So oh, I finally picked you back up. Okay. So talking about as much as you just talked about around civil war era, mm -hmm. United States, as we're talking about that time frame, I find it curious to what I wanted to talk about next. The last real memorable, most people's memories when it goes to assassination first goes to RFK, and mm -hmm. then it goes immediately to Lincoln in most, most people's minds. People kind of forget, at least I do, because I never had to read about it too much, that there was an assassination attempt on President Reagan. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you... And, and Garfield and McKinley. Were, of course. But when I think back to, you would have been extremely young. I doubt that you remember anything in the moment, but do you remember any sentiment as you started to become political in your life as you came of age? Was that moment referenced a lot, the attempted assassination of Reagan? Not really. I mean, Reagan was the first president I remember. I would have been about two when the assassination attempt occurred, so I right. obviously don't remember that in the moment. I mean, I remember certainly reading about it and some of the funny parts about it. I mean, I think that one of the things that came out of that, and Reagan never made a... a a big deal out of it. It wasn't something where 
I mean, you see, you see, Trump is has kind of appeared to be using it a bit in his campaign for so sure. far, for sure. Um, and, and definitely the party around him is for sure, right? Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of people out there saying like he took a bullet for this country and all that kind of stuff. I, I Reagan never did anything like that. In fact, what came out of that was there were a few interesting little things. Like the, the most memorable thing was Alexander Haig who was in Reagan's cabinet, all of a sudden declaring, I'm in charge here. And, and he ended up looking like a complete fool because he was obviously not in charge. But he's, <laughs> like, it was pretty memorable gaff on, on his yeah. part. Uh, like the, what I think doesn't really get told, and you get this if you read any of the biographies of Reagan, whether the most recent one I think that was pretty good was H.W. Brands and there, there have obviously been many others, but I mean, it was a very, obviously Trump got grazed in the ear. I mean, Reagan really did take a bullet that, you know, very nearly did kill him. I mean, it was a very, it was a serious shooting. It didn't necessarily appear so at the time, but where the bullet was lodged in his chest was very close to a lot of vital things and somehow managed to miss everything terribly important. The story that everybody always re references with, with Reagan is when he gets wheeled into the operating room, he had the presence to kind of joke and say, I hope you're all Republicans. And I think that when that quote got out, it sort of put a very human face on Reagan, that he had a sense of humor even in this moment. And it sort of started to build this like legacy around Reagan and his sure. humanity that I think right. served him really well. And he was kind of working on that because there was a lot of, I mean, coming out of the late seventies, there was what Carter called the, the malaise that had come across the country. And I think uh, probably the, aside from the cold war and winning the cold war, which is probably Reagan's number one legacy. The number two legacy is really restoring a lot of confidence and hope in the country, bringing back that sense of, American uh, exceptionalism, American optimism. So I think that that was really something that came out of the, the entirety of the Reagan presidency. I think that yeah. the, but the assassination never was something that he pointed to or yeah, leaned yeah. on. Yeah. 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 It was almost like it was, there was a one time, I think when he was at a rally or something like that, and there was a bang, like maybe a balloon popped or something. And he, he made a, a little joke, like missed me again or something I, like I that. Seen that one. And, yeah, seen that. and so that, that was about the only reference I can think of uh, that he ever made to it afterwards. But since we're talking about history, I, I just I kind of, I realize I've in my typical history teacher sort of way, I kind of wandered off around the civil war, but I kind of never, never finished the point about the uh, candidate selection early 20th century, we, we started seeing, and of course, you know, talking about assassinations and all, but the late 1800s, early 1900s was a very messy, messy time. I mean, we had, it was. you had Garfield assassinated. Uh, he was elected in 1880, inaugurated 1881, assassinated later that year. So then Arthur became president, which was, uh, you know, not really a, a planned presidency. He was, a um, he uh, ascended as, as vice president. And then Less than 20 years later, you have William McKinley, who had just been reelected um, and a relatively popular president, was shot, mm -hmm. which is how we got Teddy Roosevelt. And then um, Teddy Roosevelt, like, now we're into the kind of progressive era. And then there was, so there's a lot of reforming kind of activity. In fact, both parties were sort of tripping over each other to be known as the, the progressives. Wilson considered himself a progressive as a Democrat. Um, there was a whole progressive wing of the Republican Party. Um, mm -hmm led by La Follette uh, from Wisconsin. So you were looking at ways to, you know, how do we um, reform things? The 1912 election was kind of a, a pivotal moment because you started to have a handful of primaries uh, in the early 1900s. They didn't mean anything. It was just kind of to get a gauge of how people were feeling. And Roosevelt, who had um, given way to Taft in 1908, uh, was kind of unhappy with the direction of the country. And he's, or he challenged Taft. Well, um, uh, a bird just hit my window here. So I, I'm, I'm a bird hit your window. Cause that's what it sounded yeah, like. That's exactly what it was. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I don't think any birds were harmed in the making of this video anyway. So, and of course he broke off uh, the 
Republicans kept Taft as their nominee. Teddy broke off from the Bull Moose Party, created this messy three-way election, which gave us the, you know, probably the worst president of the 20th century and Woodrow Wilson. And as a result of all that, I think some of the parties started to say, well, we need to figure out a better way to get the sense of what people are really thinking because there was a ton of defections from the Republicans because there were people who really liked Roosevelt and they wanted to follow him. And so you created this interesting split. But even, you know, take it a decade later, you know, 1920, there is a very um, interesting um, and somewhat messy conventions uh, on both sides. On the Republican side, you had uh, a large, large open field with no real clear cut candidates. I mean, Wilson had kind of limped through the last couple of years of his presidency. He was a very uh, weak president in the last two years. He had, he had had a stroke. There's a lot of talk that his wife was pretty much running the country. And so the Republicans were kind of tripping over each other to get this nomination, but the process was messy. It was at a convention, people nominated, you know, all the different possible candidates. And out of that came Warren Harding from Ohio, who was a very much a glad hander. I mean, he got himself into trouble later with the Teapot Dome scandal, but he was a very much of like a schmoozy politician, which is somebody who would do well in that type of convention setting sure. where he could make some deals and, you know, hey, you you support me, I'll make you a cabinet person, whatever. But the interesting thing was on vice president, there was a strong push to by, and they sort of the assumption almost that uh, there was a, um, a senator from Wisconsin, Irv something. I want to say it was something like Le Root. I'm really stretching my Len Root. Len Root. I'm going to go with that. Final answer. But anyway, and he was kind of the, the heir of the progressive wing. He was kind of the La Follette okay. folks. And he was kind of understood that he was going to be the VP no matter who they picked because they wanted to have a, they knew they weren't going to nominate a true progressive, but that was a way to have that progressive appeal on the ticket. But when it came into this convention, a couple things happened. There was parts of the Republican Party that were outside of the Midwest that weren't necessarily keen on having Ohio and Wisconsin sort of controlling the party. They wanted a, a little more balance geographically. And in the previous year, 1919, um, there had been a strike uh, in Boston of the police uh, and the governor of Massachusetts, um, who had previously been the mayor of Boston, Calvin Coolidge, had done a, a very, you know, well-respected job of settling that, getting the, the strikers back to work, restoring order, you know, very much the kind of leadership style that gets you some notoriety. And right. so, and he was known as a conservative. And so you had this kind of groundswell amongst the conservatives, amongst the Northeastern states to push Coolidge into the vice presidency, which is how Coolidge became vice president and then later president after Harding's death. Coolidge ended up being a, a probably one of the most effective presidents of the 20th century, um, in my opinion. And yeah, he, yet, yet he was somebody who never actually declared that he was running for president and vice president. And even in that era, campaigning was still somewhat in its infancy. You were starting to see train stops a little bit in the early 20th century where candidates would get on the back of trains. They'd go from town to town. They'd stop. They'd give a little speech and keep on going. But even as late as the late 1800s, that was really, you know, campaigning was seen as inappropriate. Benjamin Harrison famously sat on his front porch in Indiana, and he was like, if anybody wants to come talk to me, I'm here, but I'm not going out there. Like, that's, you know. Let other people be my surrogates and talk in favor of me. So, so the modern campaign, um, all of that has really is a. It is not something ingrained in our initial political culture. It's been an evolution to get to where we are. Well, te and, technology plays a huge role, I would say. Oh, absolutely. And, you and uh, what was that? That was fireside chats. That was that sure, was radio. The, the first time you have a president talking in the ear directly to Americans. And from there, yep. it was, how do I get more of that? How do we get yes. more airtime? And that was in the 30s. And the, the other famous technological innovation was was the um, the televised debate. And you had mentioned the debates earlier. Yes. The the real presidential debates had started, I believe, in the 50s. I think you started to see it okay. post World War II. That um, makes more sense. I, I I really don't know if I mean obviously 
Roosevelt did the fireside chats. I don't know if there was ever a debate with Roosevelt, but certainly with Truman and uh, and into the Eisenhower era, you started to see radio debates. But they were very controlled, and there was it was I'm going to ask a question, you know. Mr. Truman, what's your response? And anyway, I'm going to ask a question, you know, here, what's your, like, it was very much back and forth, not mm. like moderator to candidate. 1960, you had the first televised debate. And the, the fascinating part of that was that p the folks who listened on the radio believed that Nixon had won the debate. Everybody who watched on TV oh, thought sorry. that Kennedy had won the debate because Kennedy kind of leaned into the new technology of television. He wore makeup. You know, he, he had shaved just before the debate. He had his hair done and all that. He looked like he had a presence. He was youthful. He was energetic. The people on the radio said Nixon's responses are better. But everybody watching on TV, I mean, Nixon had a five o'clock shadow. He looked old and haggard, mm -hmm. even though he really wasn't at that point. He uh, just... And of course, he has a had a little bit of a darker complexion to begin with, just uh, a little, little sallow, Kennedy, just, just incomparable. Yeah, yeah, just looked worse than Kennedy. And and people watching on TV said, you know, Kennedy, he's our guy. So you had that, and and yet even still, we still have conventions deciding this. I mean, primaries had started to emerge. Kennedy pointed to the primaries and his early successes as like the reason why he should get the nomination. He did very well in West Virginia. There was some question like, can this Massachusetts liberal from Harvard get people in West Virginia to support him? And he did. He did very well in West Virginia, but they were all non-binding. Um, you had conventions that would pick somebody, even in 1968, which was, of course, the, the year of the Democratic Convention riots and a lot of mess. You had, uh, I, I believe it was less than 40 percent of the delegates were selected by a primary. Eugene McCarthy had won the most delegates in the primaries. But the convention instead chose Hubert H. Humphrey uh, in in that in the convention. Of course, it was a very messy year. You had LBJ in the race. He dropped out in March. Then McCarthy kind of stepped forward. Humphrey had never even announced himself as a candidate, but he was always so there in the background. You had RFK running and then assassinated. So it was it was a very very messy year, but the average Democrat voters really felt disenfranchised because they had no say in this. I mean. Yeah. It, the, most of them probably, I mean, it's hard to know exactly where it would have gone, but RFK was showing a lot of strength in California and on the coasts, at least. McCarthy had gotten the most actual primary votes. And so, like, those were the two candidates that everybody thought we were deciding between. And then Humphrey, out of nowhere, kind of gets the nomination. So, uh, and I think the, com the combination of all that chaos plus the riots, you know, I think everybody kind of felt the country would be better in Republican hands, which is how we, you know, Nixon got elected. But as a result of that 68 uh, convention, we really started to see a, a push to binding primaries. And so it really was in the 70s. Uh, I think, like I said, it was less than 40% were committed in 68. It was almost three quarters by 1976. Wow. Okay. So like that's that was when that change happened from 68 to 76 which in the big scheme of american history is not that long ago i mean it's it's 50 years ago um now but, it's close not even quite a quarter of the length of our country so far yeah right so um so this this whole notion that the primaries determine everything is a little bit of a recent invention in the grand scheme of things for sure yeah but in terms of having uh party bosses hand pick a candidate it's not entirely unprecedented because that's what we did for much of our history so long. um yeah, yeah. it's so it's just that it, it's, yeah. it kind of it kind of feels strange and undemocratic in the sense that uh, we've been picking via the primary now for 50 years and um and this is the first real significant departure in that last 50 years from from doing what the primaries indicated. Right. But I think there's one other key point to make, and I think you kind of alluded to part of it when you mentioned LBJ and him dropping out of the race when he did, which you mentioned was in March. <laughs> With that and, being said... And, and Truman did the same thing in, in, um, right. as well, because they, 
Truman had um, had done quite poorly in the New Hampshire primary, which again was non-binding, didn't mean anything. But in 1952, he he had succeeded Roosevelt in uh, 45, finished out that term until 48. Then he ran his own term, just barely squeaked by Thomas Dewey in 48. So he was still eligible to run for another term, and he was planning to do it and ran in the New Hampshire primary, got shellacked, and at that point decided to drop out. And so he was he was really the first in the modern era, if you will, of the of where there were any primaries to kind of like see the see the writing on the wall and get out. But both he mm. and Johnson did it early in the in the primary season, which kind of gave paved the way for somebody else to step forward. But whereas, still doing primary votes, right? Like, yes, that's mm -hmm. where you see the big difference to what's happening in twenty twenty four. Mm -hmm. Well, in 52, you had um, actually in the early primaries, uh, Truman's biggest challenger was Estes Kefauver, um, who was the governor okay. of Tennessee. Uh, and uh, the uh, and he was kind of a, you know, again, at that point, you still had the Southern Democrat Party. And Kefauver, I believe, won the most primaries. I think he won something like three quarters of the primaries in 52. Um, but when it got to the convention, which still held most of the power, uh, the Democrats chose Adlai Stevenson. And so Stevenson became the Democratic nominee in, in 52. Um, again, kind of against the will of the primaries. Again, that was what was the system was at the time. The, the primaries were sort of like a, you know, just a gauge of what people wanted, but the conventions held sway in terms of deciding who the nominee would be. So 68 um, was where LBJ dropped out was really the first time you see, I'm dropping out so that the primary, and then, like, then we'll see how the primaries go. Once again, they, they did not choose the candidate who got the most primary votes, but um, I think it was probably that which changed the whole system around. And also we started getting like the Super Tuesday phenomenon where right. it became not just go to New Hampshire and try to impress some people in New Hampshire, go to Iowa and try to impress some people in, in Iowa. Now we're going to have to run a national campaign because we've got whatever, 20 states all having primaries on the same day. And that was really only facilitated by the, the evolution of media. I mean, that national primary thing wouldn't really work in the old days. Do you think that we would benefit from a mixed system at this point? Like, do you think that if there was some sort of suggestion that could have been passed down by the Democratic heads a year, year and a half ago, do we avoid this chaos now? So I think the, uh, the thing that would, the thing that's changed as a result of this primary system, and it's really been, I think, an even more recent phenomenon, um, with maybe a, a one or two exceptions, but but really only in the era of the 24-hour news cycle, is that we have started to see um, this very dramatic run to the edges, run to the center approach, where candidates will have to appeal to their base, you know, the Democrats will get very liberal, Republicans will get very conservative, and then for the general election, run to the middle. That had been kind of the, the model, but I think we've seen less of a re regression to the middle in recent elections, just because there is much of the middle left. We used to see, and, and back when party bosses chose their, their nominees, they chose somebody they thought was going to win. Right. They thought, like, who's our best chance to actually win this election? So what you got was you got relatively balanced tickets. You'd have, for example, a northerner like a Kennedy and a southerner like Johnson. You'd have somebody who was considered more of a liberal and somebody who's a little bit more of a, a moderate or more of a conservative and more of a moderate. You'd, you'd see that type of effort. You'd see parties would try to choose somebody that they thought would be appealing to the whole country. 52 being a great example, Kefauver had done very well in the primaries, but the Democratic Party felt that having a Southerner in 1952 with the, the civil rights movement kind of starting to, to if, you know, emerge in many places was not 
the best direction for the party. So they wanted a northerner at the top of their ticket, which is how they, they chose Stevenson from Illinois. You get Chicago, you get New York. That was their, their plan. So you have parties trying to get a read on the country. Sometimes they got it right. Sometimes they got it wrong. But in I think the result was that you typically had two candidates that in the end were probably more moderate in a lot of ways in that they could try, they could at least theoretically appeal to enough of the population to get elected. You're not seeing that in today's candidates. You're not seeing that um, with, with relatively few exceptions, you're not seeing that those moderate candidates are getting rewarded. You look at somebody like Mitt Romney or John McCain, who were very moderate candidates, they weren't rewarded because the electorate had become polarized. And it really came down to the fact that if you were in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, you're going to vote for the Republican, no matter who the Republican is. If you're in California, New York, whatever, you're going to vote for the Democrat, whoever the Democrat is, and essentially became a personality contest in a handful of purple states. I think that there was not the um, the sort of balance in the political landscape that you may have seen prior to the era of the 24 hour news cycle. But it's, it, and especially now with the sort of internet driven media, you've got most people are living in echo chambers. I mean, I know that there are yeah. some people, some people really, really work hard or at least claim to try to see news from both sides. Okay, I'll, I'll go watch MSNBC and then I'll go watch Fox and kind of compare notes. It's a lot of work. And yeah. I think a lot of people who claim to do that may not entirely be telling the truth. There's, no, I think there, are, there are some, but the people who do that tend to yeah. be the people who like live it, eat it, breathe it, sleep it. And the average yeah. voter, and let's face it, in the country, you know, 50 million voters, the vast majority are relatively low information voters who kind of go in with a preconceived notion of, of which side they're on. So you have this... Um, rather interesting kind of division of the electorate into safe states and competitive states. And I mean, everybody's looking at the electoral map and I mean, we could, we could pull it up right now. There's like nine states that are in play. Now, I mean, there's, I think that that might've been due now, of course, Kamala stepping in, Kamala stepping into the role really changed the race and how competitive it was. Mm -hmm. But I think with a better VP pick, with a more grounded VP pick, someone closer to the center, like you were kind of mentioning before for presidential candidate, but as a VP <laughs> pick, I think that Trump had a huge opportunity and kind of blew the shot. J.D. Vance is the pick. Now you see, I don't know how long this win lasts, but the entire <laughs> attack against Trump right now is aimed against Vance which mm -hmm. really takes away from the substance that could be what is the difference between policy of Kamala and Trump. You're not hearing any of that. Yeah. Well, Vance is new. I mean, right there's, there's, very, there's very little that anybody can say about new Trump. Trump. I think. Yeah. But, but new as part of this Trump team. Mm -hmm. I mean, Trump's been in the new, he's been, he's been president for four years. He's been basically running for president for the last four he was running for president for two years before that so the last 10 years it's been all trump all the time there's not much that anybody can come up with about trump that they haven't already heard and he's he's kind of got a little bit of a teflon quality because some of the stories that have come out have been rather damning and yet he's managed to you know pretty much move beyond them so here comes somebody new with new stories and new background and new ske skeletons in the closet or whatever whatever they may find. And so that's what's now going to be the thrust of everything. And in some cases, using J.D. Vance's words against Trump, you know, against the ticket as a whole. So I think that's why you're seeing this push against Vance. And it also mutes the focus on Kamala because exactly. Vance is like the, the newest kid on the block. Kamala, even though she's now at the top of the ticket, she's been around for a while. The, the most fascinating and, and disingenuous thing for me is that the media who were lining up in support of Biden when they thought that he was the top of the ticket 
and talking about how Kamala was, you know, too weak, too unliked, um, well, not down. a good candidate. And so we had to stick with Biden and had to support Biden. Let's get behind Biden and and 100 percent on the and basically trashing Kamala. Because they wanted to show that that Biden was the the best nominee. Yeah. And then right. all of a sudden Biden pulls out and it's like, oh, Kamala, you're wonderful. She's a breath of fresh air. She's energetic. She's this. She's that. Like Joe is. Huh? Joe is the hero, and she's a breath of fresh air. Right. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. the the amount of from the whether it's cringe on Pierre or anybody else on the left, the you know talking about how you know wonderful the Biden presidency was and how he accomplished more in four years than most presidents do in eight. It's like we got more to do in six like, months. Oh my gosh! Like what? Where are these people? You know, how do they do this with a straight face? It's it's unbelievable. That, but, they get, that's why they, they get paid the big bucks, John. Yeah. But you see Kamala, you mentioned her kind of like running the big campaign from her basement. And that's – she's – right now she's kind of like playing to the base. And I think it's it's not a – to be honest, it's not a terrible strategy. I don't – It's the best strategy against Trump. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that and I think that she's, she's setting it up for the convention because obviously the convention will be a chance for her to like show herself as the candidate. You know, she did the Zoom call with – you know, a hundred thousand white women or whatever. And then she did another thing with like the women of color for Harris or whatever, which it's actually, it's kind of funny that it's, it's such a, a stark um, attempt to divide people into groups and, and identity yeah. politics and to separate the, the electorate, which is, I mean, really been the path of the O Biden to bond. Uh, Obama to Biden to, I guess now Harris approach to politics. Yeah, it throws me back a lot to 2012, 2008 a little mm-hmm. bit. But 2012 was when basically the whole electorate surrounding Romney versus Biden was it was a lot of race talk, and it seems that we're back into that mode now. Of course, you have a woman involved. It is going to be a lot of sexist, a lot of. I haven't seen too much of the anti-LGBT, but I know that's probably going to be an attack. And then as well, anti-color being racist. <laughs> um, that attack line, me being somewhat, I lean conservative, but I've been much more to the middle, especially this election. It, it gets tiresome to hear that so constantly. And it gets hard to take you seriously when you start talking policy. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it was Mitch Daniels, the governor of Indiana, who I really liked and wish he had run for president at one point or another. And maybe the fact that he speaks well to his character and the yeah. fact that he, he ended up becoming president of Purdue University, which um, maybe was too smart to get in, into presidential politics, but he was governor <laughs> of Indiana. Um, and, I, and he had a quote that said something along the lines of like, no feature of the Obama presidency has been sadder than its constant efforts to divide us. Um, uh, something like to, to curry favor with some Americans by castigating others. And really that's how politics has evolved. And, and whether we, and some of it's the data driven nature of how people view the electorate, which I mean, Hey, you know, we have this technology. Now we have a lot more data than we ever did. I get why it's important for campaigns to understand these things, but the amount of identity politics and, and breaking people into um, little pigeonholes and saying, well, you are, you know, uh, whatever, insert blank dash hyphen American, you know, it's like an well, number in the system. Right. Um, you know, you are 83% likely to vote this way. And therefore, you know, we're going to put you in this category and it, it we're not, we're going to target our advertising against this demographic because we think that, you know, our statistics show that white suburban women in homes with incomes in excess of a hundred thousand dollars are the most likely to be registered Republicans that we can get to go vote Democrat or, or whatever the the statistics might say. And that type of targeting is becomes very distasteful for everybody who's not in that, because especially when as somebody who leans one way or the other, and you see that the other campaign isn't even trying to win your vote. You know, in the old days, I mean, you look at the, the, the Reagan campaign of 84, maybe the most notable. Mondale was a very flawed candidate, but, but 
Reagan cast a big net. I mean, he he wanted everybody's vote. He talked to everybody. He and he won California. He won New York. Uh, we're talking forty years ago. These states that are considered, you know, blue wall, never could possibly vote Republican today, voted for Reagan. You know, New Jersey voted Reagan. Both times they voted for George H. W. Uh, Bush in ninety two in uh, in eighty eight. So I mean, to think that this was you know, these states that today are, are aren't even on the political map, they were in play at a time when people, you know, when the campaigns were reaching out and reaching to more than um, than just their base. And and now I think you see a lot of states just you know, of the fifty states, forty one are are ignored pretty yeah. much because it, it comes down to can i get more suburban women in ohio to, or whatever to vote for me yeah it becomes that specific and again I, I think exactly what you said probably two minutes ago is a perfect point when they're not even trying to get your vote that's when it feels the worst to pull the trigger for either kid because mm -hmm. you're not being fought over there's no just... you know it it really sucks as someone who you know i don't fancy myself a historian by any sense but i love history and i love the fact that we have the opportunity as a country to be as great as we once were in my opinion at all times just with a shift of mindset and we're getting in my opinion further and further away from that point by creating these fissures in between different groups of people it could be class it could be race it could be sex it could be sexual orientation at this point it's a major one Saying that you can't come together on a policy decision because you're in a different group like that, it, it becomes really hard to vote one side or the other because I shouldn't, even on the other side of that same coin, I shouldn't have to think one thing just because I vote one way. I shouldn't this... have to follow that line every single time. It, it makes it tiresome to have debates where you might be talking with someone who's across the aisle, but they're pointing out opinions that you don't even hold yourself, but it's just because of who you may have voted for. Um, that's where I, I find the disintegration of today's politic. Yeah. And you also see um, there's been in the last decade and decade and a half, this sort of purity test standard yes. that yes. has come into parties. Um, and in some ways it actually started a little bit on the conservative side. That's you had back in the eighties, the there was a fellow named Grover Norquist who did this um, essentially uh, he would, rate how economically conservative all of the members of Congress were. Now, and isn't that something it, we could use right now? <laughs> but but what, it, <laughs> what it did is it, it pretty much created this like standard of, you know, if you wanted a good rating, you had to toe the party line and vote. Basically had to vote certain, all the time. You basically had to vote in line with, you know, are, how conservative are you? It became yeah. a litmus test. And what ended up happening is that the primary is now more democratized where every, everybody can vote. But the people who actually show up to vote in primaries tend to be the most active party members on the Re Republican side, the most conservative on the Democrat side, the most liberal. The average, like, you know, middle of the road, not terribly partisan voter doesn't go up and show up for primaries. So the people who are voting in those primaries do not necessarily reflect the overall electorate, but they're the ones choosing the candidates. So you've, you had different movements. First of all, on the Republican side, you had the Tea Party movement. You had on the Democratic side, you had the variety of things. You had the the sort of BLM litmus test. You had uh, the Occupy movement. You had these different um, you know, movements where if you didn't stand in line and support all of these things, you kind of got labeled, well, they're, you know, in the Republican side, you're a rhino, you're Republican in name only. On the Democratic side, you're, you know, you weren't a true believer, you were, you know, whatever. And so you had on both sides candidates who were mainstream, well liked, moderate ish people get ousted by extremists um the, you know the line enough yeah. yeah maybe the most the one that really jumps out to me as a huge missed opportunity was in delaware uh, there was a republican congressman it was a delaware only has one congressman uh republican at large michael castle and castle was there for decades he was the republican representative from delaware he ran for u.s senate 
and he would, but he was, and he would have easily won. People loved Michael Castle. Nobody was going to, uh, just wasn't going to happen. The Democratic Democrats we, actually nominated we Joe Biden or no? So he, so this was actually, I believe, Biden's seat because Biden had gone up to become VP, and the Democrats actually nominated this guy who was really a nobody, and he was a self-proclaimed socialist named Chris Coons. They knew Michael Castle was going to win this election, but in the primary, Castle was challenged by this Tea Party whack job named Christine McConnell, or o O'Donnell, or O'Connell, or something, something like that. She was like the the lady with the witchcraft, whatever. Sure. And she edged out Castle in the Republican primary. And she was swept in the general. Yeah, she was an absolute basket case, and sure enough. Chris Coons, who would never have beaten Michael Castle in a million years in a general election, especially not a self-proclaimed socialist, wasn't going to beat this well-loved, well-known, you know, 20-year congressman. Yeah. Very moderate. But what cost Castle that primary was that Castle was pro-choice. He was very moderate. He was kind of soft on a lot of the social issues. He didn't follow the Tea Party line, so he gets challenged and ended very up losing. Huge missed opportunity because that would have been a pickup for the Republicans and that would have been a, a Senate seat they would have held for the last, you know, I'm sure Michael Castle's probably in his 80s now, but it, they would have held it for quite a number of years. Sure. It's been Democratic ever since and yeah. they, ne they never got it back. And there's been other ones. Interestingly, though, I think you're finally this cycle is the first time I've actually seen someone go the other way. Uh, in New York, you had that Jamal Bowman, who was part of the sort of a fringe member of the squad, if you will. He had AOC stumping for him. Of course, the crazy part of that, he represented a district that was largely like Westchester County, and yet he's holding rallies in the Bronx. Right. Not his district, but that's where he felt he had more support. So bizarre, but he got ousted by a somewhat more moderate mainstream yeah. Democrat this time, who will almost certainly go on and win the, the general election. So you had, a, but I think that was largely a product of the fact that Westchester County has a relatively large Jewish Democratic voting bloc. Bowman had been anti-Israel. Yeah, he and became they, pretty strongly anti-Israel out, outwardly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that more than the other politics, I think, is what did him in. But, um, but interesting to see a little bit of the the. A, a, a little course correction there. Um, and yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be necessary. It's just a matter of um, does this populist movement continue where, you know, like you were mentioning before, fighting over nine states and all of the people coming out for primaries, generally speaking, are the most extreme of the party. You're lining yourself up to smack each other with the two sharpest hammers instead <laughs> of maybe planning for your opponent, getting the best weapon possible for that. Um, yeah. I mean, you have to say if the party bosses were choosing candidates in 2016, you would not well, have Hillary and you definitely wouldn't have Trump. Actually, I think you would have had Hillary. I mean, because I think that the, you might have still had Hillary. Yeah, because I think Bernie Sanders did was kind of showing more strength in the primaries, but the superdelegates all lined up behind Hillary. But you certainly wouldn't have had Trump. I think you would have you probably would have gotten Jeb Bush. Um, yeah, I think he was the, the, it would have been a Clinton versus Bush again. Yeah, he had most of the money behind him at that point, uh, and I think a lot of his, his large donors were kind of ticked off that he he did as poorly as he did. Mm. And then t this time around, uh, I mean, twenty twenty, you really can't even fathom because Trump was the sitting president and nobody really challenged him there. But um, this time around, I think you probably would have gotten DeSantis um, most likely. I think he was. He was probably the best positioned mainstream candidate with a track record so. in a he state won an that awful primary though. He he came off as a much he, different he, person than he does otherwise in that. And campaign. I think and I think some of it had to do with the fact that he was trying to be somebody he wasn't. He was trying to so. run against Trump and out Trump him. Said, yeah. Whereas like DeSantis's record in Florida was much more matter of fact, let's get stuff done. And I think he proved himself a pretty competent executive in Florida when you, but when you try to be Trump and, and try to, and uh, you know, the elections are what Trump does really well more, more than govern. I mean, Trump is obviously he's a showman. 
he's he's a showman. He's a TV show personality. He's a media sensation in that sense. He gets attention even when he doesn't try for it. So there's the old line, you know, all publicity is good publicity, and and Trump leans into that harder than anything. I mean, he doesn't because I think he has relatively little guile, so he doesn't seem to care. Okay, you want to put me on trial? Fine, I'm on camera even more. That whereas, mm-hmm. like, I think most people would be horrified if somebody accused us of a, of a crime, even if it was unjustified. Trump kind of just seems to roll with punches and like, oh, great, more attention. Yeah, uh, definitely. Well, I think we definitely wouldn't be where we are now if we had that party boss mentality. Before I let you go, John, I have to ask you, the most pressing thing that's going on now, it seems that Biden wants to leave his legacy and his legacy that he wants to paste on the boards everywhere Mm -hmm. is that he basically wants to completely change the core tenant of the Supreme Court of the United States. I don't think this is totally unprecedented. We did have a president, or if I'm not mistaken, we have multiple presidents just add justices to the court when it wasn't going their way. That being said, changing the rules of lifetime time appointment, starting to essentially, it seems like force outing all of their donations or any sort of money that's involved between any politicians and the sitting judges. So you have to disclose any sort of conflict of interest that might come up You're hearing a case possibly about a company or about a sitting, sitting congressman, whatnot. All these rules that come in, not necessarily that they are opposed by the the will of the people, but I think it's odd that it's coming from just the executive branch, these changes that are being proposed. How do you, how do you view? I kind of lost the second half of your question there because you were breaking up a bit, but I think I got enough of it. So I would say to me, this is entirely a campaign tactic. I think it has 0% chance of actually going anywhere in terms of changing the lifetime tenure of justices, in terms of imposing term limits, not going to happen because those are things that are in the Constitution. You would need, you know, and not only an overwhelming vote of House and Senate, you would need two thirds of the states to to line up behind this idea. And it's just not not going to happen. I mean, two thirds of the House and Senate, three quarters of the states. Um, you're not going to get 38 states to ratify this. You're not going to get two thirds of how you can't get two thirds of the House and Senate to agree to, to adjourn for lunch. Um, totally a, a, a campaign tactic and a talking point that they want to try to expose corruption and probably pick on Clarence Thomas and and all that. Uh, but not a realistic suggestion. The code of ethics is the one that in some sort of a version, I think you might see some movement on. Um, I think you might see some, but the house and Senate have a relatively, you know, questionable code of ethics themselves and that they accept money left and right in the, in the name of lobbying and to their campaign funds and their PACs and all that type of stuff. So they're kind of hardly the ones to be the arbiters of morality when it comes to accepting money and gifts. But I think you might some movement on, because that would only require basic legislation. You wouldn't need a a constitutional amendment to put in a a code of ethics. That's something that maybe could go through in some type of a watered down version. I don't see it happening quickly or easily in terms of all the other stuff though. And uh, and I'm not talking about whether it makes sense or whatever. It's just not going to happen. Um, right. I think, yeah, And that is one thing that I mentioned in, in my spiel that hopefully is still recorded is that it may be the public will that we want to limit the terms <laughs> of the justices. But that's not for, in my opinion, the executive to make that decision. It's written, as you said, in the Constitution, <laughs> it's written that this is a lifetime appointment. Yeah. Basically, Biden's using what, you know, they, they would call the bully pulpit. In other words, he's he's got the at the floor. He has the voice, the position to articulate his opinion and what he thinks should happen. Hmm. So he's using that to push this onto the agenda and to see if it goes anywhere. But uh, it's certainly despite Obama's uh, tendency for executive orders and all that kind of stuff. You know, this, this is not something that would ever fall into that category. Hmm. And because of, I mean, it's very hard to get the Constitution amended. I don't see it happening on something this controversial. Yeah, that was my gut reaction to it. And to be honest, my real gut reaction to it is that 
we're probably going to have seven or eight more of these announcements of major legislation proposed because this to me was so outlandish and that most people had a reaction that were at least somewhat understanding that this is written into constitution that it's kind of not feasible for him to say that especially the main point which was i'm going to put a term limit on all justices yeah and and it's so of all the people who should be talking about you know mandatory retirement ages he's the I mean, funniest one about it you're right it, it is but yeah. yeah but uh, i think the um you know the fact that the supreme court has in some people's minds become polarized is a bit of an issue but you also have to say like even in the very recent memory it was john roberts republican appointed john roberts whose vote on the obamacare bill let that stand just because somebody's appointed one way or the other does not control how they're going to vote. Uh, David Souter, who was um, George H.W. Bush appointee, eventually was considered to be the moderate to liberal side of the, the court. Amy Coney Barrett so far has been willing to sway, especially on issues pertaining to women. Anthony Kennedy, a Reagan appointee, was known to go back and forth. I think what you are seeing, though, is you're seeing less can in that position where they are likely to swing back and forth. I think you of the recent appointees, I mean, Kagan and Sotomayor are, are virtually lockstep on the liberal side of things. Kagan once in a while, once in a long while will diverge on the Republican side. Kavanaugh seems to be lockstep conservative. Barrett on a lot of things seems to be conservative. Gorsuch is the one who I, I think Gorsuch is, was the best pick of the Trump presidency. I mean, I, I do like Barrett. I, I, I don't have a real strong feeling for Kavanaugh, but I, th I think Gorsuch was a true constitutionalist and, and somebody who, you know, if presented a case, even if it meant siding with the quote unquote liberal position would would follow the Constitution very explicitly. And I think you've seen some decisions where Gorsuch will seemingly oddly cross over, but when you look at his constitutional rationale, it makes a lot of sense. You know, Ketanji Brown-Jackson is just hopelessly to the left, and Roberts has kind of become the moderate in this whole fray. Even when he was appointed, they considered him a conservative, but he's, he's now become a moderate, essentially. Just by stance of how everybody else around him has shifted. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think it's not necessarily a great thing that you see justices timing their retirements to try to make sure that their successor is of the same ilk. Right. I mean, let's face it, like if Trump gets reelected, you'll probably see Thomas retire. Yes. If Trump does not get elected, you Thomas will probably will probably not see probably. Thomas retire in the next four years. Down. So you have that component and, and, it, and they balance only gets tilted when something happens like Ginsburg dies in the in the wrong it, term in, yeah, in the wrong term it almost happened with Scalia uh, Scalia was at the very very end of Obama of course Merrick Garland who everybody thought was kind of a moderate pick at that time proved himself to be a, a bit of a you know a whiny shill during the, the whole COVID <laughs> period so I mean I think we may have dodged a bullet there but um yeah 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 definitely I, it's just another Unfortunately, it's just another aspect of the American politic. I think you've mentioned it a few times in the show. It's evolved. That legislative branch has definitely evolved, in my opinion, not in a great way. Because mm -hmm. you, as an American, I would want the justice system to remain as close to the Constitution as possible. Granting the obvious case that we are over 200 years past that date when it was written, and we can understand that. Following the core tenets of at least the Constitution is the main point, and it seems like we're becoming further and further apart from that, more so following what the current winds are facing in our either party as a justice, I'm no justice. But that I do see as a negative, and yeah, it'd be interesting it's, to me to see how the rest of this plays out. We still have a VP pick to come from the Democratic side, so everything any, about... Any more. guesses on that? Um, yeah, why don't we end on this? My my guess is that it's going to be Buttigieg. I think it's going to be Buttigieg. 
he's funny. He's he's really become very. He's been in the media a lot the last couple yeah. of weeks. Um, yeah. So he he is definitely proving himself to be a loyal lieutenant. He definitely, I think, is on the short list. Uh, don't honestly think that. I don't think it's going to be him it only because be Josh Shapiro. I don't think they'll do. Shapiro would be a most logical pick in in some respects from a, from a geographic point of view and the fact that you really need to win Pennsylvania. I think Shapiro does not have a long track record. Oh, he does not. Uh, he is considered a moderate. Even though he, he, is, is, he is considered a moderate. And I think the fact that he is a moderate is Very important. W- w- would be good for the ticket, but not necessarily all that appealing to the liberal base. Oh, no, no, not at all. But to the broader base and to the broader country at this point. But yeah, that, unfortunately, that's not how they're picking it. I mean, uh, <laughs> oh, and I don't, I don't think that he has a chance. I was just mentioning yeah. what I think might be the best pick, but I don't yeah. think he'll be. I think it'll be Buttigieg. I, I think it's going to be Kelly from Arizona. Okay. Um, yep. And the reason I think that is that Arizona was one of those states that had been blue for a couple cycles. It's a state that Harris absolutely has to win because if Trump could, and and Trump is currently leading in uh, an Arizona. And he certainly he was leading by quite a bit when Biden was still in. I think he was up by about five in Arizona. Now he's leading by like a percentage point or, you know, just the slightest tilt. You put somebody from Arizona on the ticket that may push that back into the Democratic column. If they don't win Arizona, then all Trump needs to do, if he can win Arizona and Georgia, he doesn't need the upper Midwest. I, th- I think he has to. He has to come up with. I forget the math on it. I, I feel like if he wins, he has to win Nevada. If he wow. wins Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia, you don't need the upper Midwest, and the Democrats can't risk that. So if they can win Arizona and hold Arizona, that forces Trump to win one of the blue wall states: Pennsylvania, right. Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. That is, I think, that has always been the tougher thing for Trump to do. We'll see how, I mean, those are all very, very close at the moment, but I think Harris has, has closed the gaps in those states a little bit compared to where they were with Biden. I think, I, I thought with Biden in there that Wisconsin was the the easiest to flip, but Harris, I think, will probably have a little bit more appeal. Wisconsin's a, a quirky state because you've got like the vast majority of the state is like dark red, and then you've got Milwaukee is blue and Madison is like the deepest blue of all blues. So it, you need to energize Milwaukee and especially Madison. And if you can do that, if you can get Dane County to really, really, really show up, that goes a long way to winning Wisconsin. And I think Harris probably thinks she has a better chance of doing that. And she so, probably does compared to Biden. And she, and she probably does. So, you know, if she can hold their Michigan, Again, Detroit was not necessarily going to show up for Detroit or, um, sorry, um, Michigan and Pennsylvania both have large cities, which have always been a democratic strength. You've got Philadelphia, you've got Detroit, always places you can find democratic votes. Wisconsin doesn't really have that big city phenomenon. And so Wisconsin is the hardest of those three to hold for the Democrats, I think, in general. But without Arizona, you don't need it. And so I think that's why. And also Arizona, you've got the Mark Kelly is married to Gabby Giffords and Gabby Giffords, you know, was, some name, definitely some name traction that will get out there. Right. And the whole, like, you know, gun control thing. And, you know, well, Trump got shot, but so did Gabby. And, and like all of that stuff playing together. Uh, it's a, it's probably a lot of a story that they can kind of weave together. Kelly wasn't, you know, not, not only has the gun control, he's got that personal story with Giffords. He's got the astronaut background, all that stuff that even though he is a little more liberal, probably plays, plays pretty with well. certainly the liberal base. So, right. um, and I think that, that Buttigieg, as much as I think he is, I, I think he is a really bright guy. He doesn't come across as like a bigger than life figure, you know, like somebody like a Trump. He seems to be more of like the, the kind of guy you would want to help have you help balance your checkbook or something like that. Not necessarily, which is not that that's a bad in the big picture. Maybe the country needs that. 
it doesn't necessarily play well in elections and when you're trying to yeah. add something to your ticket. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I still think they're going to go that way. I think they've got to find something. <laughs> I think that the play from Democrats has to be intersectional all the way. If they've, they've done it with the basically the forcing of putting Kamala as VP in the first place, she now is the presidential nominee for their side. Um, and Pete Buttigieg it checks off a box of a white male, but it also checks off the box of of being a part of the LGBT crowd, which I think that that gains a lot of points with the with the real ingrown left. Yeah, but, I agree. I think the the one difference, though, I think that I mean the the hardcore left. It's not like they're going to defect Trump anyway. I mean, no, uh, and I will the say hard, the hardcore. Hard you have to get them to show up, and yes. maybe maybe that does get the LGBT folks to show up more, but they're probably going to show already, up anyway. And they the all vote is already casted. Yeah. And, and they're the largest concentrations of LGBTQ populations tend to be in blue States already. Correct. So Correct. Um, it's not going to necessarily tip the balance in a we'll square state. one thing. I think that Kamala's campaign is basically I think it was a lot of backroom dealing to get her where she is so confidently with all delegates promised. I think that her pick <laughs> is chosen for her, and it is going to be who I think the Democratic Party thinks will get them. I think it will be a yes. totally backroom. It's not going to have anything to do with Kamala's personal choice. That's all I yes. got for you and, today, John. Really? All right. Well, we I shall know, see. I know we said 6.30 and it is 6.45. I feel terrible keeping you any later. Yeah. That's all right. We had to uh, overcome some technological issues, and I hope the recording hey, works out okay. I don't know what happened with my Wi-Fi today, but thankfully, this lovely program will make it look a lot prettier than it looked on our end. John, again, I can't you thank to, you enough. Yeah, you were awesome. We have to do, do a little editing along the way. <laughs> uh, that's that's for sure. But thankfully, we did this early enough. I could do that. John, again, can't thank you enough. This was a. Uh, oh. If you didn't learn something from this, you weren't paying attention. I'll put it that way. Well, it's not, not too often I get to break out, you know, SD's key fall for trivia. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, we'll name one more. SD's key fall for. Key fall for. That is, that's going to remain <laughs> my brain for a while. Everybody else, hope you go look up all the lovely people we talked about. Check out the processes that we were outlining before. We basically haven't had, really, haven't had primaries to vote in except for the last 50 or so years consistently. And being as though that process is so new, maybe it's not that crazy that Kamala got put in the situation that she did. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Hope you guys enjoyed and, everything and else. John, anything else you got for the show? And we're out of here. Yeah, just, it's just uh, you know, you're, you mentioned about how this is a evolution of how we, we select presidents. I mean, the whole movement was a democratization. It's like, you know, give more to the people. But, you know, our founding fathers were smart guys. They but they kind of created a republic. They they did not necessarily turn everything over to through a direct democracy, d direct election. They Absolutely. they set up a republic with many baffles, so that the will of the people could be expressed, but that there were some guardrails put in place. And as the democratizing movements of the last hundred years or so have have you know little by little you know first changed how we elect senators, changed the nature of the electoral college, changed eventually how we select our, our candidates and then eventually through conventions and then later on with primaries. It's it's an evolution and whether it's taking us in the right direction or not, I think, you know, we'll uh we'll have to see. Have to wait and see. I guess we got a little bit more watching to do. Everybody else, this campaign is not even close to done. We got a whole hell of a lot more shows to come on. Probably have John okay, on one more time before we finalize this election season. Other than that, I hope y'all stay good. Catch you next week. I wanna be something, not nothing. Trapped inside my dream, and I'm running, running away from these demons. But the feeling's so good, I'ma keep dreaming.